Honestly, I'm, I'm supposed to hear this say welcome to all of you, welcome to Ripley House, but honestly, it's just a really welcome back to Ripley House because I think there's hardly anyone here who hasn't been with us before. Um, it's a great pleasure always for neighborhood centers to be able to host any group who's thinking about and looking after what makes our city and region stronger. Um, it's particularly uh, a source of pride to us to have worked with a group whose focus is really on how we make this region, developing a plan for making this region work for everyone, and particularly communities of color. So we know that the story of the region right now is one of vastly expanding opportunities. And there is no Houston leader that will take pride in the expansion of those opportunities if they're not available to everyone. So today the focus is really about how do we make this, uh, how do we make this plan come alive in our region so that everyone here gets connected. Um, first, I want to say some special welcomes. I, they have here a former council member, Melissa Noriega, but she's just council member forever for us. So, Melissa, welcome. Um, uh, a special welcome also to council member Gonzalez. Um, thank you for being here. We say we work with him all of the time. I'm thinking perhaps he and his wife both think we just call them all the time. And that's true. They're great leaders, both of them in our community. Dr. Flores from U of H down great partner. And then I understand we have representatives from uh, uh, Representative Cal uh, Carol Alvarado's office, from Senator, Senator Ellis's office, from Councilmember Bradford's office, and from Councilmember Castillo's office. Thank you all for coming. So, so I feel like I'm the good news, bad news woman. Here's the good news. Um, we have a great panel and a great information to present and share and a terrific audience. Uh, the bad news is Angela Blackwell uh, could not make it today, though she planned to be here. Her plane couldn't take off yesterday because of bad weather and she couldn't get here in time. Uh, so you might notice the slight resemblance, Angela Blackwell, Angela Blanchard. I'm filling in for her. Um, that's happened before, actually. She and I have been together uh, is, or we, we, we joked uh, on a number of panels and, and a couple of times we were confused for one another. I don't know how that happened. I'm taller than she is. Um, <laughs> but uh, the last time we were together, we were at the White House with the President, so I had the great honor of sitting um, with Jeff Canada on one side and Angela on the other, and we were having a great conversation with the President about uh, efforts that really work across the country where neighborhoods and communities are being transformed. I was there, as usual, passionately speaking about Houston and why the work in Houston is so important. The number one reason is when you work here to connect people to opportunities, the great thing is those opportunities are here. So it's a great Houston as a place of investment for people is a really important city right now. We have a very different story than the rest of the country, but that creates a huge obligation on the part of the people here. And so, thank you for coming today and meeting your obligation to folks in this city who have been looking for a long time for a chance to advance themselves and their families. Okay, so I'm turning this over to Mike Likes. Mike's going to come up, introduce our panel, and then we're going to begin the program today. Um, thanks again. Big, warm, heartfelt welcome to Ripley House and to neighborhood centers. Enjoyed your lunches. And uh, first, before we go into the panel, uh, I would like to introduce David Crosley uh, of Houston Tomorrow. He is going to come up and speak a few minutes about equity and what it means to our region. Thank you. It's so good to see all of you. And, and I'm, I'm, turns out I'm the bearer of bad news. We know that Angela couldn't show up today, and neither did her, is her partner able to come, who was going to, who was going to present this profile to you. But we will, we will wing it. We are also, we had uh, Stephen Kleinberg decided he would set it, step in, and he would take care of this issue, and uh, and we can't find him. 
So, so, but we'll, but we'll get through it all one way or another. And uh, I, I can't see the screen. So, am I ready to go? So, I, I have to say, I'm, I'm really disappointed. When I started my organization, Houston Tomorrow, in 1998, the first thing I did was go to a bunch of conferences. And the first one I went to. I heard Angela Glover Blackwell speak, and I mean, she just is the best. She can set the table better than anybody I know. So it's a real loss that we won't have her today, and, and, I'm, and I'm personally just sort of devastated. So I thought what we would do to kind of cover a little bit was to, my son Jay has done a lot of research into the people who make decisions uh, in Houston, mostly about transportation, but there's huge equity issues. Uh, in terms of transportation. So I was going to show you some of his slides if I can move around here so you can see them. Excuse me. So, so the first thing we all know this, and this is what Dr. Kleinberg would, would remind us of, is that most... Oh, this is the wrong one. Okay, so the next slide will show you what I was about to start saying. But if you look at the county 65 county judges and commissioners in the 13 county area, there are three females in that whole set. And there are very few, 62 males, three females, and you can see that they are, whatever that number is, 92, 90 something percent white men making the decisions at the county level. So careful they turn this off. So this was sort of interesting. Two years after the Civil Rights Act was passed, these were the commissioners at, at Waller County. Today in Waller County, there are still 80% of the, of, the, of the people who make the decisions in Waller County are, are white males. At the, and the other county commissioners from the other counties, who they all are, it's an overwhelming picture, you get it. Um, we have uh, you know, three, this is the little pie chart on the left. Is the, is the numbers we know about, 6.3 million re people in the region, very diverse, very, no, no majority anywhere anymore, in, in, even in Texas. And, and they, are, they are not, they don't look at all like this group of county judges and commissioners. At the, at the Harris County level, we see um, five men, one of whom isn't white. <coughs> That's that again. At the, uh, the Houston mayor, the Houston City Council is pretty diverse. We all know that. So, so it's a much better picture than we're seeing. Oh, Dr. Kleinberg has just walked in the door. <laughs> this is an interesting picture, and it's largely because, you know, we vote differently in the city. We have smaller districts and precincts and so forth. Whereas Harris County, you know, there's four guys that represent six million people, or four million people. So. And then the, uh, the, the Houston mayor, well, that's, the, that's that number, pretty, get, getting better, but still a lot of white males. The Houston Galveston Area Council, the uh, Transportation Policy Council, which makes the decisions on transportation spending in our region, is, is this group here. And here we see there are three females, 25 men, and just, you can see a little pie up there, just few people who are not uh, Anglos. The Metro Board of Directors is not so bad, but still it's the same issue. And you just keep, we're gonna just keep seeing the Gulf Coast Rail District, a little bit more diverse, but still mostly white males making the decisions. Uh, Grand Parkway Association, overwhelmingly white males. The West Houston Association Board, which is a very powerful group of people, you can see there what we're, what we're up against. Upper Kirby District Foundation as an example of a district where things are getting a little bit better, but still, it's an issue. The Texas Transportation Commission, and I'm going to show you uh, another slide here in a minute. That, actually, no, I'm not. So, so the person on top of them is the governor, who we all know is, a, is another white guy. <coughs> And so all these entities combined, we have we wind up with this kind of chart, the little one over here on the right, uh, is some females, and the one on the left is, is some males, mostly males. And there are two points, this is tricky stuff, is what the next thing I'm about to do. And so there's two and a half million non-Hispanic white people, and they are the percent of, represented by 25 uh, white people on the Transportation Policy Council, which is 100,000 to one. 
the half a million Asian, Native, and other people are represented by one Indian American on the TBC, which is 500,000 to one. A million black people represented by one black person on the TBC is a million to one. 2.2 mil, million Latinos represented by one Latino, 2.2 million to one. So, uh, what does that mean? Only U.S. born Latino, I don't know what that number means. In any event, as Dr. Kleinberg has said, every business in Houston is either gonna learn how to capitalize on this, uh, so this capitalize on this burgeoning diversity in the city, or find it harder to, and harder and harder to grow their business. So that's the, that's the thing we're up against. Everywhere you're trying to go in and make decisions uh, about equity and about how to do things for all the people, you're confronted by these overwhelming non-diverse uh, boards and councils, and, and of course the, the strangest ones are the ones we elect, because there's an opportunity to do something. And then finally, this is, a, this is sort of what you get when the people have a one view and, the, and the, well, those others have a different view. This is from the, uh, greater, from the Houston Galveston Area Council did a big survey as we were doing this regional plan for sustainable development. 9,000 people answered the survey. And if you ask people how you would spend $100 on transportation, this is how. And the really interesting thing, do I have a pointer here? The really interesting thing here is that people would spend more money on sidewalks and bikeways than they would on new roads and highways. But what we're gonna do is build new roads and highways. People would spend twice as much on transit as they would on new roads and highways. But that's not gonna happen. And I can tell you, and I have to alert you, we're now working on the 2040 Regional Transportation Plan. And so far, all it is is all the projects that were in the 2035 plan plus some new ones mostly new toll roads. It's, it's, I, I, I don't wanna say 90% roads, but it's, it may not be quite that, but it's overwhelmingly new roads in order to drive people out to the suburbs beyond the Grand Parkway, where we now envision a Prairie Parkway, another route, <laughs> in order to get people out of the cities because people in the cities tend to vote kind of urban. And so we don't wanna encourage that city stuff. So when you look at this, um, and I'll, I'll only say what it means is that here we spend more on roads in Houston than in any other region in the United States. We are the kings in terms of spending on roads. That's the 22,005 population. The red stuff is developed uh, as, as sort of commercial land. The yellow stuff is housing and so forth. This is the projection. Oh no, did I lose it? I lost it. Well, the projection. It's just terrifying, and we now have the 2040 projection. And basically, all the forest in Montgomery County is gone in 2040. All the green space in Harris County is gone, except for the land that is already parks. We lose most of the southern part of the sort of wetlands area, those very sensitive places down there. It's all because of the Grand Parkway, of course. And, and we've already lost them, by the way, most of the the forest had been, you know, it was a 200 acre clear cut for the Exxon thing and so forth. So, we're, so, the, so the region is planning to move people further out to drive more and to say goodbye to about 1,200 square miles of what is now farmland and wilderness and so forth. 1,200 square miles is twice the size of the city of Houston, one of the biggest geographic cities in the world. So I'll stop there and I'm somebody, if I just go past, what will happen? Just turn that off. Good. And I'm very happy to see Dr. Stephen Kleinberg show up here, and, and I'm very excited to hear what he's going to be saying about this. He's dug into this, and of course, he already knows all this stuff. So he's our expert on what we're going, to, what, what opportunity is going to look like in Houston, Texas. Steve Kleinberg, I'll give you this machine. Remarkable convergence and understanding of the fundamental transformations that 
going on in Houston, across America. Most of you know this, you've heard me make these presentations before, but this is a few new pictures that are, that are really interesting to see. And tied into what David was saying, we are in a revolutionary age. We come, have come out of an age of total dominance by animals, so they're still in all of those positions, but there's an inevitability to the future that is gonna be powerful and fascinating as we go forward. Okay, this is not working.
So it was like 33% Negro, 18% African American, 7%, 8% Asian. And now I'm about to show you what we believe is the single most ethnically diverse county in the world. Fort Bend County today is 19% Asian, 24% Latino, 21% African American, 30, 36% Anglo. You can't get much closer than one third, one third, one third than that. One fourth, one fourth, one fourth than that. And, it's, and it is what makes Houston. There are very few Asians in Miami, there are very few Hispanics in San Francisco, there are very few African Americans in Los Angeles. Of all the multi ethnic uh, melting pot cities in, in this country, Houston has the most even balance. All of us minorities, all of us called on to build something new under the sun a truly successful, inclusive, equitable, united, multi ethnic society that will be Houston and Texas and America in the 21st century. I'll show you that in just a second. This is, this is Fort, Fort Bend County. But the other big county surrounding us is overwhelmingly an Anglo County, and that's Montgomery County, of course. But Montgomery County, that was 81% Anglo in 2000, added a bunch of Anglos, and is now only 71% Anglo. So this ethnic transformation is occurring everywhere. The, uh, this is another way to picture this. This is Harris County. In 1980, there are 293 census tracts in Harris County. And, and the census said, here in blue are all the census tracts in 1980 that were majority, at the majority Anglo. In red is the third ward and the fifth ward, the majority African American uh, census tracts. Around the ship channel was the Segundo Barrio where the Latinos were in orange, and then a few places with no majority in that olive color. Okay, so that's 1980. Here is Harris County in 1990. So that African the Latino population is surging numbers heading north and east, and now surrounding the Beltway, more and more of these, of these uh, census tracts with no majority. Here it is in 2000. Here it is today. Is Houston's destiny, with no one having chosen this, no one consulted with me before all these people came. Houston's destiny is to be at the forefront of the demographic transformation that is occurring across all of America, nowhere more clearly seen than in Houston, Texas. And it's not just numbers, it's also ages. So here I've got my babies on the left and the old folks on the right. And here, some of my chagrin is where all the Anglos are. So these are 12 different age categories, and here are the Anglos. So you can see the baby boom, by the way, right? The 76 million Anglo babies born in this country between 1946 and 1964, preceded and followed by baby bus generations. The modern talk about like a pig being swallowed by a python, moving along the system, not very healthy either for the pig or the python. The leading edge of those 76 million babies born in that incredible period after World War II, overwhelmingly Anglos, of course, because that's who was here to be born in that period after World War II. The leading edge of those 76 million babies turned 68 this year. And we're going to watch a literal doubling of the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. And by 2030, in 15 years, the youngest of those 76 million baby boomers will, will turn 65. That end, this is the epic transformation of America. The, the generation of Anglos is moving rapidly into the sunset. And behind, and the future of America, is a multi-ethnic, large community made up of immigrants and children that will be Houston and America in the 21st century. The, uh, and then uh, after the baby boom, the percentage of Anglos plummets, the percentage of African Americans, Asians, and above all, Latinos surges. And that's what Houston looks like today. And everybody under the age of 20, across all of Harris County, not HIS, but all of Harris County, everybody under 20, 51% are Latino kids. 20, 19% are African American, 9% are Asian, just 22% are Anglos. So that's the sort of inevitability of this process, right? No force in the world can stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more Latino, more African American, more Asian, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. Nothing in the world can stop that. So the only question this generation has been given is how do we make it work? How do we ensure that this rising generation is prepared to succeed in the knowledge global economy of the 21st century? Houston, the tremendous asset that this ethnic diversity can be is Houston persistent to sell them. Second largest port in the country is the gateway to the global, global economy. Greatest asset this city could have or it could tear us apart and become a major liability, reducing rather than enhancing our competitiveness in the global economy. Much depends on how this generation speaks to this remarkable convergence of forces that is shaping the Houston future. So this, and here are just Latinos. So it's, it, 
Turns out African Americans and, and Asians are about equally distributed across all the age groups. But the real story is this Y shape, right? Anglos only have to reach people over this age of 65, or a majority of people Anglos, and then the young people disproportionately non Anglo and especially Latino. Here is Texas very quickly, the same, the same uh, picture. Uh, in, in 2012, and it looks an awful lot like Houston, Texas, about two years behind, uh, two years behind Houston, uh, Texas, and California, the two largest states in the Union, both of which are now majority minority states. Here is the United States today, still an overwhelmingly Anglo country, right? But the same pattern of, of the baby boom Anglos heading off of the wilderness. And uh, here's everybody else, and the census actually now said, in our latest, our latest estimates, more of uh, across the entire country of everybody under the age of five. The majority are now non anglos across America. And then the census says, you know, we've got these actuarial tables, and uh, we can, let's make an assumption that no new immigration comes to America. We can tell you what America will look like in 2050. And here's the picture. So the same patterns. Here are the angles again, but here's where everybody else is. And so that's very close to Houston today. And it is a really a fair statement to say that how Houston navigates this transition, with what kind of sensitivity, commitment to build a truly successful multi-ethnic society will have enormous implications, not just for the Houston future, but for the American future. This is one of the key places where the American future is going to be worked out. We are where all America will be in the next 25 years. So this is the place that makes, I think, the issues that we're dealing with and we're working on together more relevant and powerful than ever before and, more, and much more relevant than just to the future of Houston. Uh, and then back to, back to the it's, it's wonderful science that shows the percentage. Everywhere you look, right, the, 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 the orange line is, is, is the growth of non-Anglos and the gray line, the growth of Anglos. Everywhere you look, the growth, the bulk of all the, the new population growth across the entire region is coming from non-Anglos and this whole transformation in Houston, where, where Harris County and Fort Bend are at the lead, is happening everywhere, including Montgomery County, as we saw just a little while ago. Uh, and then the, here's, here's the projections into the future uh, for this entire region. You can watch the percentage of Anglos just continue to plummet in each, in each decade, percentage of Latinos above all else surging, and then fairly equal percentages continuing for both African Americans and Asians. What a powerful picture. I mean, if you project these trends, you get in Harris County a, a, a world where 12% of the entire population is going to be Anglo in 2050, and 75% of them be Hispanics. I mean, it's just, it's not going to quite turn out that way, I don't think, but it's going to come close to what is a remarkable new reality. Uh, and uh, it, this is their, this is their nine, their, their I'm sorry, their 12 counties, uh, and this is, and the percent who are going to be majority Majority Anglo, I'm sorry, majority non-Anglo by 2040 is almost everybody, right? And the other ones are going to be 40 to 50 percent non-Anglo. And Harris County again leading the way. You know, this is a, again sort of the, the psychology of inevitability, right? There's a, a, one reason why I have some more, some more optimism than David does sometimes is, is that there is this phenomenon. Psychologists have studied this: if something is happening in my world that I don't like, that I would never have chosen but I become convinced it's going to happen no matter what I do. There is nothing I can do to stop it. It is going to be the world that, my, that I and my children are going to be living in, and I get convinced of that. Then it triggers something in the human psyche that we, we, we get a rethinking. Maybe this is not such a terrible thing. Maybe we can make this work. Maybe I can make money off of this. And you can begin to see <laughs> the city of Houston increasing in all of our surveys, increasingly positive news, or, or decreasingly negative about, about the ethnic diversity and about, about uh, immigration, including uh, undocumented immigrants. So that's number one. And then other great central fundamental question is about economic vitality, right? And so again, the, 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 the Washington group has been enormously helpful in all of this, but here's me again. This is, this is that remarkable period after World War II when the rising tide lifted all boats. We emerged out of that war, the sole economic power on the planet, all of our potential competitors were decimated by the war effort. 50, 38 percent of all the jobs in America were union jobs. The unions could negotiate with the companies to ensure that workers shared the prosperity of the, of the corporations. And the rising tide lifted all boats. Unbelievably, the poorest 20 percent of American families 
more than double their incomes in the 30 years after World War II. The richest 5% doubled theirs, though, and those, of course, were the years when we celebrated the stay-at-home housewife mother in suburbia. The average American woman gave birth to 3.6 children, while the average American man, whatever his job was, literally doubled his income, making more money every year between 1950 and 1970. And the baby boom was launched upon the land. That was the world that we like to still think we live in, a world of equality, of opportunity, a world where everyone can make it if they're willing to work hard. This is the last 30 years. And virtually all the benefits of economic growth have gone to the richest 5%, most of that to the richest 1%, and a striking redistribution of earnings out of the hands of the poor and the middle class in the hands of the rich and the super rich. The bottom 20% of American families have dropped in income the poorest 20% of Americans are more poor today than they were 20 years ago. The, the, the minimum wage in, in 2014 was $10.58 an hour in 19, 1980. It is, what, $7.53 today. We can't seem to find a way to raise the minimum wage and people who are working full-time in the Houston workforce have an opportunity to earn enough money to support a family. The bottom 60% of American families have stagnated or gone down in the last 30 years. And the richest are making out like <laughs> I'm not accusing anybody of uh, Why? What happened? Two big things happened. Number one, globalization. We are now in a single worldwide global economic system. Companies can produce goods anywhere, sell them everywhere. If you are doing a job that I can train a third world worker to do, and I pay that third world worker $10 a day to do that job, I'm not going to pay you $10. If you are doing a job that I can program a computer to do, you're just at the beginnings of the robotics revolution, I'm going to turn your job to an intelligent machine. Suddenly, education, always a good thing to have, has become absolutely essential to a person's ability to earn enough money to support a family in the knowledge of the economy of the 21st century. And that is the great central question. It, the schools are as good today as they've ever been in American history. Kids are learning more now than they ever have before, not nearly enough in a new world where the big employers in Houston back in the 1970s was a huge tool company, Cameron Ironworks, good blue collar jobs, just on the strong right arm, willing to work hard. Those jobs are gone. Blue collar jobs remain, but they require one or two years of education past high school to, to get the technical jobs. There's a big shortage in Houston today of skilled welders, of skilled mechanics, of skilled uh, hospital technicians, you can get these kids to high school, one or two years of community college, there are $60,000, $70,000 a year jobs waiting. But getting them through into that position is going to be the great question as we go forward. And the economic vitality is the percentage of real wages have dropped in Houston. The uh, working poverty, people who are working full time in the workforce but still locked in poverty is the number 11th of all, the, of all the 115 regions that we compare ourselves to. And the income inequality rank 13 years in a couple of pictures. Oh, here's the unemployment rate in Harris County, Texas, in February of each of the years of the surveys. There's the, the you know, we did our first survey, everything was going like hunky dory back in 1982, collapse of the oil boom, recovery in 1984, the old saying was stay alive till 85, and then the big hit when the falling price of oil kept falling at 10.1% of employment in 1987, and then another uh, dip in the, in the, in the beginning of the 1990s and a little in the 2000s, and then the last, in the Great Recession of 2010, 2011, 8.6, 8 8.5%, 8 dropping to 7.3, to 6.8, to 5.7. Houston is doing better than any other major country, major city in the, in the country. We have an unemployment rate that's a full percentage point below the national average. Uh, we congratulate ourselves on, on this. What's that saying now? Please, God, give me one more oil boom. I promise I won't screw this one up. We're in the midst of what many people see as an oil boom. It's a very different kind of economy than the last one was. The rising tide no longer lives on boats. And, uh, and, uh, and the inequalities, there's economic vitality. Houston is doing better than the nation as a whole, right? Uh, in unemployment. And, 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 but in, uh, inequality is also doing better than the rest of the country. And more inequality in Houston, on average, than the country as a whole. And then here's the poverty rate in Houston, uh, much higher than the, than, than the national average, even though our unemployment rate is low, the poverty rate is high. And there is uh, the percentage of, of working poor going up consistently over these years in a way that reminds us that uh, inequalities in Houston are palpable. 
are fundamental, are central to the opportunities and hopes for this city as we begin to think about this epic transformation and who the children and grandchildren of Houston are going to be. Uh, and economic vitality, education is a leveler. This is people, everybody with less than high school, high school degrees, some college, college degree, postgraduate education. In red are African Americans. You can see no matter what level of education they have, they do less well than any of the other groups in terms of, of uh, unemployment. And the uh, and same thing is there at the bottom in terms of the median hourly wages. Education is critical, but racism remains and is another part of the central challenge uh, as we go forward. And then how ready are these, are these communities for the jobs and opportunities of the 21st century? Uh, we ask people, uh, wanted our, is everyone aware of how important it is to get education beyond high school? So we asked this question, we said, for a person to be successful in today's world, is it necessary to get an education beyond high school? Or are there many ways to succeed with no more than a high school diploma? And in Harris County, three-fourths of all Houstonians understand that and recognize it. I fight a losing battle against people who keep saying to me, if only those Latinos and African Americans valued education the way Anglos and, and Asians do, there would be no problem that we get everyone would be doing fine. So I can break this down now by ethnicity, and here's what you find. African Americans and Hispanics understand the importance of education even more than Asians and, and, uh, and Anglos. If they're not getting the education they need, it is not because they don't recognize the importance of education and value it, it's because of poverty. It's because of everything that poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public school system. 70% of everybody under 20 in Harris County is African American and Latino. The two groups overwhelmingly the most likely to be living in poverty. Again, we know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public schools. I tell anyone who listens, it is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African American and Latino young people are unprepared to succeed in the knowledge, global, high-tech economy of the 21st century, it is impossible to envision a prosperous that is who we are and will be as the 21st century unfolds. And education attainment is just, you know, uh, this new immigration is unprecedented in American history. The immigration of the last 30 years in two fundamental respects. Number one, it is, of course, non European. The big story of America is that between 1492 and 1965, 82% of everybody who came to this country from anywhere in the world came from Europe. Another typical. 12% were African, working as slaves to serve the Europeans, a handful of Chinese and Japanese working as farmers and laborers in California and Hawaii. This nation throughout all of its history was an amalgam of European nationalities. we become a nation of immigrants again, and 88% of all the new immigration coming to, to America in the last 30 years is coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. And the United States is rapidly becoming a microcosm of the world. The first nation in history that can say, we are free people, and we come from everywhere. It's a remarkable change. I mean, the same one, the American economy is becoming fully in a global economic system. This immigration is bifurcated and non-European. Bifurcated because one group of immigrants are coming with higher levels of professional skills than we have ever seen in the history of immigration. And one group is coming with striking educational deficits relative to the average education gap. Asians and Africans. This is the numbers of the percent of, edu uh, of, in our, of Asian immigrants, less than high school, high, some high school degrees, some college, college degree, postgraduate education. 66% of all Asian immigrants in Houston have college degrees. 66% compared to 40% of U.S. born Anglos. So when Anglos say, you know, there's a lot of minority myth, these Asians came with nothing, no money, no education, no commitment, no vision, virtue, hard work, strong family values, and high intelligence. They have succeeded, proof that America is a land of opportunity for anybody with the right kinds of values. If you blacks and Hispanics aren't making it, you no one to blame but yourselves. Look at the Asians. When you look at the Asians, you discover they are coming from educational and income backgrounds that are far superior to the average Anglo background in Houston, Texas. And here are the U.S. born blacks, about 20% uh, without high school, 20% with college. Here's the U.S. born Latinos, 27% without high school, 18% to college, and here are the Latino immigrants. Right, the mirror opposite of the Asians, coming with extraordinary energy, vitality, good health, commitment to hard work, but with stunning educational deficits for a city and a time when education has become absolutely critical. What happens to their children becomes the central question for the Houston.
And it turns out it, it matters among Latinos what their countries of origin are. Mexican immigrants, Salvadoran, Central Americans are the ones coming with very low levels of education. But Cubans and South Americans and, and Hispanics from, from Europe are coming with much higher levels of education than the average Anglo. So it's again a bifurcated stream going in. But the key point is that 90% of all the Latinos living in Harris County, Texas, 90% come from Mexico or Central America, and only 10% come from Cuba or South America. So it's that 90% of the Latinos that, if, that on which the future of Houston depends. Uh, and, then, uh, and then this is, I think, the most devastating statistic I've ever across. It comes from HISD that asked the question of high school seniors who are about to graduate from HISD who took the SAT and the ACT test, you know, which is uh, admission to college, what percentage passed that test at a level, a minimum level considered to be college ready, able to do college work? And here's what it looks like. 8% of African Americans, of 80% took the test, 8% passed it. Hispanics, only two thirds actually took any of the tests. And of those who took it, only 10% passed, which means about 6.5% all Latino high school graduates are able to do college level work, which means they go they go into the community college system, ready to, to get those jobs as, as welders, and they have to take remedial courses, teaching them, teaching them what they should have learned in high school, for which they get no credit, and a large, large number drop out. How do we turn that around becomes the central question for the Houston future. And, and the final chart from, from the equity thing is, if we could turn it around, this would be the richest state in, in, in America. If we can't turn it around, it's going to make Texas as a whole far less competitive, far poorer than it otherwise would be. And the difference is $243.3 billion if we could close the gap that now exists between the education levels of African Americans and Latinos and the education levels of Americans and Asians. So it's a, it's a remarkably interesting and challenging point. This is, there's so much positive things happening in this city, so much that for all of us to feel proud of what we're doing as a, as a community and how we're addressing these questions. But this is the question. This is what will determine the future for Houston and indeed the future for America. Thank you all very much for opening it to questions, thoughts, comments. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Conner. You're a great pinch hitter. Coach Craig, talk to you about the team. I'd like to go ahead and move into our panel discussion now. Uh, as many of you may or may not know, Houston right now is in the middle of tremendous opportunities uh, that we need to make sure that all of our citizens are taking advantage of. We have a panel here that's going to discuss what some of these opportunities are and how People can achieve and take advantage of these great opportunities. I want to have Katie Liss come over. Uh, Katie Atkins, Liss. Sorry about that. And uh, introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Hi there. Um, wow, so much great information to inform our work, inform how we're doing our work, um, and make sure that we're all on the right track. I think the really encouraging thing in all of that is um, that I have a personal experience. I get to work every day with communities. Um, and what I'm seeing is that people are really hungry for the change. They're really hungry for the opportunity. And so um, despite all the statistics and all the odds, um, it's looking pretty good from where I stand. So um, maybe I'm not the best. So my name is Katie Atkus, and I work with Houston LISC, which is the Local Initiative Support Corporation. And we do exactly that. We support local initiatives. Um, specifically, we support community-led neighborhood revitalization. So the neighborhoods we work with, when they want to do it, we help them make it happen. So education is one of those one of those points. Uh, workforce development is another. Um, and so I'm really honored to be able to introduce the panel today. Um, and I'm going to start over here um, with Tony Jackson. And um, Tony is a partner with the affordable housing and real estate practice of Jones and Walker. She concentrates in affordable housing financing and community development law. She has more than 20 years of real estate experience in both private and public sector. 
um, which is really interesting because if we're going to make it happen, if we're going to build healthy communities, we need to be bringing in multi uh, multiple funding sources. So I like that mixed finance model. Um, she serves as special counsel to a number of public housing authorities, including HUD, and also handles state and local legislative matters around affordable housing, construction, specialized financing tools, and other real estate issues. Um, she is the chair or past president of 1,001 organizations, um, including the American Bar Association, the Texas Affiliation of Affordable Housing Providers, Habitat for Humanity um, Board, the Houston Lawyers Association, and was also a member of the American Leadership Forum Community Development First Class, um, which is exciting. I was here when you all did your project here in this very room, so welcome. Thank you for being here today. And you all have already met Dr. Kleinberg, so I'm not going to introduce him again. Thank you for being here. <laughs> and to my right is uh, Chad Burke, who is the president and CEO of the Economic Alliance in the Houston Port region. He's responsible for the oversight and direction of all operational and finance considerations of the organization, which are plenty. <laughs> Huge amount of work. Um, he's previously served as project manager um, in the Technology and Economic Development Division of Texas Engineering Extension Service, which basically means that he has a whole lot of experience coordinating regional planning um, and sustainability planning. Um, he also serves on the board of directors for the Gulf Coast Economic Development District and the Armand Bayou Nature Center, and serves as the chairman of the Deer Park Education Foundation. And finally, we have Carolyn Watson, um, who is the Vice President for Corporate Responsibility at J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, she leads and manages the film, firm's philanthropic investments for Houston and San Antonio. And um, her career spanned 20 years with roles in nonprofit, government, and business sectors. Again, a very valuable cross-sector um, perspective. Uh, she's a native Houstonian and an active community, vol community volunteer, and in 2007 was named Woman on the Move by Texas Executive Women for her professional and civic contributions to Texas. So, thank you for being here. And finally, I would like to introduce the moderator of the panel, um, who is Ava Brown, and Ava is a professor at the University of Houston School of Social Work, and um, I'm going to turn it over to her. Thank you. you all for being here today and for you all for this great um, opportunity to share. So we wanted to open it up with each of you having about 10 minutes to share a little bit about um, your perspectives on equity as it relates to all the information we've talked about and then we have a couple of questions um, that we would like to ask. So Chad, we'd like to start with you. Sure. <laughs> Let me, uh, I'm going to follow Dr. Clownberg's lead and stand up so I can see these, these slides here. So uh, I am I'm Chad Burke with the Economic Alliance Houston Port Region, and that organization is a is a nonprofit economic development corporation that is made up of these 16 different communities around the Houston Ship Channel. In essence, it's the um, and and then also it includes chambers of commerce, community colleges, U of H, Clearly, all the school districts around there, private companies, Harris County, uh, who is represented here by Andy. Young. Um, and uh, the Port of Houston Authority. So this group of this group of communities and companies got together uh, back in 1985 and, and decided to create this organization to help grow the economy along the Houston Ship Channel. And so that's that's our mission. Our mission is simply just to uh, to to grow the economy. Um, and I'll give you a very brief overview of, of what is driving our local economy and our little sliver of, of Harris County and, and this greater Houston area. Um, and then, and then tell you how that feeds into our part of the equation, which is, uh, which is a considerable effort in workforce development to try and meet the needs that are out there right now that we, we're fortunate to have here in, in Houston. So this picture, if you have not seen this before, is, uh, is a map of, of America, North America, that shows the, the shale gas plays um, uh, in, in dark red. In Texas, we have we have a couple of significant plays in the Barnett Shell and the Eagleford Shell. You've probably heard of both of those. Up in North Dakota, you can see a really nice uh, a really nice area up here called the Bakken, 
uh, shell play, and then up in the northeast is the Marcellus shell play. And what has happened, um, the onset of the technology um, uh, created here in North America uh, of fracking has unleashed oil and natural gas in abundance that has created a, a lower price of, of natural gas um, that is competitive globally. Uh, now Saudi Arabia is really kind of our only um, legitimate competitor for the price and abundance of natural gas. And, oh, by the way, what do we do already with this natural gas and oil? It all gets funneled down to the Gulf Coast to be manufactured into in products um, that, that we consume and, and export. Uh, as Dr. Kleinberg said, Port of Houston is the number one exporting port, the, number, the second largest port in the country and the number one exporting port. We ship more goods out than anybody else um, around the world. So you have this convergence of, of lower price abundance of natural gas in North America and, oh, by the way, we manufacture that, uh, we, we, we produce or process that natural gas um, along the Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast, uh, more so than anywhere in the country. Um, and so what that has created is, is, a, is, is the shift from around the globe to manufacture um, this, this natural gas, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, whereas five and six years ago we were competing with projects in, Singapore and Asia and UK and really around the globe to try and convince companies to land their manufacturing here in Texas. Um, now the, the only real competition is whether or not it happens in Texas or it happens in Louisiana uh, because of the, uh, the price of uh, an abundance of, of natural gas now. So the American Chemical Council announced uh, this about a month, maybe two months ago, that, that there are currently 188 uh, shale-related capital investment projects in the country domestically, totaling over $116 billion. Uh, so that's kind of the, nat the national picture right now. In the Houston Ship Channel alone, we have now between $35 and $45 billion in capital investment projects in the manufacturing of, of natural gas and specialty chemicals. Um, so you can see we've got, we've got the lion's share of what's going on because we are, Houston is the home to the largest petrochemical manufacturing complex in North America and second in the world only to Rotterdam. And so obviously we would, if played right, we would get the bulk of that, of that work. So, so regionally we have $35 billion. As an economic development corporation, um, we are working um, basically as recruiters to convince companies to locate and expand here because it creates jobs and, and everything that goes along with that. So, so we, we are working on 31 different projects right now that, that equate to almost $4 billion in capital investment. And that's kind of our sales hopper. Those are the those are projects that we are working on. Now, what has fallen out of that this year, year to date, is five wins that total uh, 225 direct jobs and, and over, well, a little over $1.7 billion in capital investment. Um, and these are direct jobs in the manufacturing industry, which again, the American Chemical Council quotes seven to one indirect jobs. You get the highest bang for your buck in petrochemical manufacturing and indirect jobs. So, um, a little bit about where we are. Uh, you heard again from Dr. Kleinberg about the, the, the fortunate economy that we have here. Um, so since the recession, you can see over 400,000 jobs created since the bottom of the recession here in Houston. Um, so we, we're not short for jobs. We have one of the lowest unemployment rates out there. Um, but the, the net effect is that now we have more jobs, skilled jobs, available and in demand than we have um, qualified candidates for. Um, we, have, we have two things converging at one time here, not only in the Houston Ship Channel, but here in Texas and in North America. We have, we have the aging of the workforce, so we've got, we've got um, very high percentage of people that can and will be retiring over the next few years. Um, I had one plant manager um, talk to me uh, earlier this year and said, Chad, at any one time I could have above 50% of my workforce walk into my office and retire. And that, you know, and that puts them in a very risky situation. So you've got the aging workforce that is ready to retire, and then on top of that, you add this multiplier of, of um, capital investment and growth in our production capacity here at the Houston Ship Channel. 
and it creates a scenario where we're very, very short in, uh, in, the, number of, in the number of jobs. Um, this survey that we helped with a couple of years ago showed over 100,000 uh, construction-related jobs um, to, to, the, to the petrochemical industry. Um, the, our partners at East Harris County Manufacturers Association have just gotten finished surveying their members to try and get a real specific number on how many, how many uh, uh, positions or, or jobs that they need to fill and in what skill discipline. Um, that's in draft form. We actually just received that yesterday and um, hopefully that information will be coming out very shortly soon and they get uh, approved by the board. So we've got, to, we've got, we've got a, an abundance or really a, 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 a hole in, in the amount of skilled workers to fill these jobs. And so what our organization has done is partnered with all of the, the stakeholders there, um, the industry, the community colleges, the high schools, um, really anybody in our region that is interested in working this issue, we have brought together on a committee. Um, that committee has come up with, with uh, uh, three basic objectives. Um, again, we kind of prep each meeting with, we're not here to try and change the world, we're just trying to, want to try and affect some change in these 16 communities along the Houston Ship Channel. Um, and, and, and convince more people to take advantage of these careers. And so what we did was we, um, we created a, a, a marketing program that consists, uh, that really wants to reach out to students, teachers, counselors, and the parents to try and shift the conception of what these jobs are and then also inform them on how to, what the pathway is to get to these jobs. Dr. Kleinberg mentioned, you know, you need at least one, if not two years of education to access these jobs after high school. Um, and it's very economical. I mean, you can get a two-year associate's degree for, for less than $10,000 compared to a four-year degree for over $100,000 with most of our major universities. So we've created materials, and I got a two-minute warning, so I'm speeding up. We've created, we've created uh, flyers or trifolds that have information that talk about the careers, that are available, all of these demands, these jobs that are in demand. Uh, they talk about what they, what you need to do to access these jobs. Um, and then we include um, in those conversations in front of the schools, in front of our, our schools and uh, uh, students, um, how do you get there? What's the pathway to get there? Do you need financing? Do you need grants? Do you need scholarships? Um, so when we go, we include, and so far since January, we've had a little over 30 conversations in in our high schools. We did one in the neighborhood centers with Mike uh, and the group in Pasadena. Um, and we converted everything to Spanish. And we had Spanish presenters and, and, and really went after that market um, because of the demographics. Um, th this industry doesn't discriminate. They want qualified workers. And, and, and they, they literally, it, they don't see that. They see is the person qualified or not. Um, so, we take industry, community colleges, students, and those newly employed students, and we put them in front of high school students, and the most powerful ones, we talked about this in the committee meeting this morning, the most powerful ones are the young ladies and the Hispanics and the African Americans that have achieved these jobs, and we put them in front of the high school students that, that don't know that these pathways and these opportunities are out there. When they see someone that looks like them that came from the schools that they came from, you, you can literally see the wheels begin to turn and the eyes begin to open and, and those pathways uh, to this type of career and life-changing careers really begins to take place. And the one thing I didn't mention, most of these careers, um, uh, certainly in the petrochemical industry, the starting average salary is about $86,000 a year. So it's, 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 it's really life-changing uh, and family-changing. These are just some of the shots of some of our, our speakers. Um, and I'll just blow right past that since I've been given the, the warning to stop. So uh, that's that's all I had. And certainly, uh, when we get to it, we more than happy to answer some questions. Thank you so much, Chad. From the data, because all of the data that you've seen so far actually drives housing. Housing is tied to all of those things. My first question that I posed. to everyone and want us to all think about is 
Are we no longer tolerant to live next to, door to people because that person doesn't look like us, act like us, dress like us, drive a similar car, or have a similar occupation? But the question when you ask that is, is that because of race or is it because of income? And that's where we are with housing because it's oftentimes when we're talking about housing, it's easy to talk about the tangibles. And the tangibles are all the things that have already been discussed in the, um, in the data that you've been shown. The tangibles are real easy. They're jobs, transportation, grocery, retail, schools, those are the tangibles. And so it's very easy for us to track the data and look at where housing should be or shouldn't be when we look at whether or not those tangible amenities exist when we're building new housing, be that rental housing or home ownership. You make those choices based on most of those amenities when you're considering where you're going to live. But the data can track the intangible amenities or the intangibles that we all think about when we're also thinking about where we want to live. Is that your safe haven? Is the tradition of your community there? Are the cultural concerns that you have there? Is it close to my church? Can I find a hairdresser or a barber? Those are the intangibles that all of us consider when we're deciding where we want to live. And so that's what makes housing a really harder part when we start talking about the inequalities or trying to make things equitable. Because you can go off to work, you can go off to school, you can go off and find those other amenities, but is that safe haven going to still be there for you? Are the other things that you are concerned about going to be in your home? And so it gets real tricky when we talk about housing. And it gets real tricky, particularly when we start talking about affordable housing. We have a concern now as we continue to build affordable housing, particularly because too often we are finding that we're building affordable housing in communities that are high impacted with poverty and our race. However, when you start talking to persons of color, more often than not, they still want to be in those communities because, again, that is their safe haven. However, when we talk about the amenities, we equate those to high opportunities. We want people to be near jobs. We want them to be in situations where the school systems are better and they are able to be leveled out because of that playing field of better education, better jobs those other amenities. When we look at school, I mean, when we look at building housing, particularly when we're putting the public dollars together, the um, Texas Department of Housing and Community Development and HUD, they look at those places of high opportunity. And oftentimes, places of high opportunity are equated to white neighborhoods. However, how do you go into a place of high opportunity go into a white neighborhood when you're not wanted, when we have situations of nimbyism, not in my backyard. I don't want you to come into my neighborhood because you don't look like me. You don't dress like me. You don't drive a car like me. Again, is that income or is it race? So these are the things that are being very challenging as we continue to look at housing issues. When someone is going out to get a loan because they want to purchase a home, it's very easy to track the data and say, okay, well, that person may not have gotten the loan because their income was not there. But it's also data that we're tracking and we have found real evidence that people of color have not gotten some of those same loans. We've also tracked the data to show that sometimes people of color who choose to live in those traditional color, um, neighborhoods of color also don't get the loans. We've heard of redlining. Because of redlining, insurance prices are higher, being able to get the mortgage may be harder. And so all of those things impact what we look at when we're looking at housing. So the question becomes, how do we find 
a place of equality. What determines equality? Is it to allow someone of color, our minority population, to have a choice to go into those high opportunity areas? Or do we create equality because we have decided to, it's time to rebuild our neighborhoods of color so that all of those same amenities exist in those neighborhoods? We find too often that when those neighborhoods are being rebuilt, we find that it's because we have the Anglo population that is coming into those neighborhoods, and now they are pushing the persons of color out. Gentrification is heard in a lot of our neighborhoods, but then they become a high opportunity neighborhoods, and then no longer have issues with not having those amenities. But then, can the people of color still live there? Those are all the things that we continue to really struggle with when we are building housing. The question of, is it about choice? But the bigger question, is it race or is it income? And it's something that we all have to really give some real thought to. Because again, oftentimes the data can track the amenities. It can track the things that we are concerned about. The jobs, the schools, transportation. All of those things that everyone wants to make certain that they're near when they build a home when they rent an apartment. We want to know all of those things are available to us. But do you also have those intangibles? Is it your safe haven? Is it near people that look like you? Is it near people who will welcome you? Housing becomes a real issue, particularly when we're looking at putting the public and the private dollars together. As recent as just this past week, the Supreme Court made a decision to hear a case that actually originated here in Texas. Um, the Texas Department of Housing and Community Development, TDACA, was sued a couple of years ago by a group out of Dallas called Inclusive Communities Project. And basically what ICP said was that, hey, TDACA, every time you award tax credits, and something to build those new apartments, you are putting those apartments in areas of low poverty, or you're putting them in areas and you're continuing to segregate. So there's an issue here, and we need the Supreme Court to take a listen. However, the Supreme Court also agreed last year to hear a case that was almost the reverse, where you had two communities of color, African American and Hispanic neighborhood, who sued because they did not want to be moved from the area that was being redeveloped and they being, um, they being displaced. So again, which one is right? We don't build in the areas of low income or high race concentration and don't displace people, or we put them in places of high opportunity and displace them, but don't have some of the intangible amenities. These are all real questions that we constantly have to struggle with. Right now, the Supreme Court is about to struggle with. The case where the minorities actually filed, that case was um, ultimately, it was um, actually agreed upon, they negotiated a settlement. The Supreme Court, we're gonna see what they say on the TDACA ICP case. Uh, but, it, but again, the thing that we all recognize is that when it comes to those intangibles that you can't measure and you can't track, we have real issues of determining how do we find that place of equality. Thank you. Much, Antoinette. I think we can all agree in Houston you can't really drive anywhere without seeing construction, new development going on and so I think there is a concern about where are people going and where are they living and where can they find affordable options for housing. Um, how can, as Dr. Kleinberg said, how can the rising tide lift all the boats? So Carolyn, want to pass it to you? Thank you. I also want to thank uh, Neighborhood Centers and Policy Link and LISC for hosting Chase today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, as I was getting ready. I think it's probably got my closer own. to the speaker. So. I, need to move. I need to move out of my comfort zone. <laughs>
So this, this is much better. So uh, as I was getting ready for work this morning, uh, the commentator was talking about uh, the weather, and they were saying, gosh, you know, it was raining yesterday, it was messy, but today is the day we've been waiting for. <laughs> and I look outside the window and I'm like, wow, it really is. And in Houston, when the economy is robust it is, as it is, and producing all these jobs, for those of us working in to promote regional equality, equity, today's the day we've been waiting for. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what Chase is doing to make those opportunities available uh, to people, more people, so we, they can share in the region's prosperity. Um, but as, talk, I'll tell you a little bit about the foundation. Um, as Katie mentioned, I manage the philanthropy for J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation for Houston and San Antonio. Our foundation works globally, and last year we awarded over $190 million to nonprofits around the globe. That places us in the top 10 of U.S. based corporate foundations. Uh, in Houston, we annually award over $2 million to nonprofits. So a couple of, about a year ago, we announced some new funding priorities. And we came to those based on a rigorous assessment process. We looked at what community needs were, and then we mapped those against what we as a financial institution are uniquely positioned to do. We also looked at what matters to us as a business, and that's strong economies with people advancing up the economic ladder. And with those assessments in hand, we settled on our four priorities, which are workforce readiness, financial capability, small business development, and affordable housing. Our commitment to these areas is expressed through our signature initiatives. An example of that is New Skills at Work, which is a five-year, $250 million global commitment to invest in workforce. That amount places us in the top 10 are of the top uh, funders of workforce. And you've got more information about that on your uh, table uh, with this uh, brochure here. In uh, Houston, we made a $5 million commitment over the next five years in workforce. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're making those allocation decisions because $5 million sounds like a lot of money, but uh, it's can go quickly because the needs are so vast. And so what the way we're investing is through our new skills at work strategy first and foremost. We're making investments to build a demand-driven system. We're investing in the best training and we're investing it to help organizations get that real-time labor market information, what they call real-time LMI. And an example of that is the study that Chad referenced uh, with the uh, East Harris County Manufacturers Association. They surveyed their members to find out what their needs are. And that real-time information helps education and training providers best allocate their resources. So that's one way we make our decisions. But within that, we also look at local context. And I'm going to explain how we understand the local context. Okay, so what you see before you is a map of our workforce, regional workforce system. And we designed that at Chase with some input from stakeholders. And it's a very busy map, but it barely touches the complexity of our local education and training system that's preparing people for work. Um, so I'm just going to speak to it very high level. And so on the left-hand side, you see the supply side. Those are all the organizations that are preparing people for work, K through 12, post-secondary, military, et cetera. On the right-hand side, you see the demand. These are the people that are doing the hiring. And at the very bottom, you see our Gulf Coast Workforce Board. And that, work, that is our public entity that spans both supply and demand. And so with that, the main takeaways that I want you to have is where, what we're aiming towards with our investments at Chase is to move demand to the left side of supply. Because we want to create opportunities for employers to routinely communicate with education and training providers and communicate their needs about what their skill requirements are. We also, I also want you to notice that both supply and demand are on this map. 
So, so when we're designing solutions to address these workforce challenges, we need to keep the needs of both supply and demand in mind. I mean, you all know better than anybody else that we, we have to design solutions to meet the needs of the people going through the training programs because you can have all the training you want, but if it's not available and they can access it, they're not gonna pursue it. And finally, what I'd like for you to take away is the arrows between these boxes. And that's what we call bridges or connective tissue. And these are things that help people transition from one system to the next. These are things like early college high school, where students while in their high school, while they're in high school, can earn college credit. Or students in post-secondary who have internships uh, with employers can learn how to navigate the world of work. Well, these are the kinds of things that keep people from dropping off once they graduate. It helps them know what the next step is. We've got some of that going on, but we need, we need it to serve more people. So that's a systems perspective. Um, but the numbers also tell a story. And for households in Houston, we know that one in three families is living on $40,000 a year or less. And it takes $50,000 a year for a family of four just to cover the basic necessities. So we've got a lot of people working really hard and not getting by. Also, when you look at from an economic lens, we had the Greater Houston Partnership has reported 41 planned expansion, energy expansion projects just in Houston, representing $17 billion worth of investment with the potential to create 6,000 jobs. And 60% of the employers say our region has a big challenge in producing the skilled people we need to fill those jobs. Furthermore, economists say that if we don't produce the skilled people, those, those projects could be stalled. So those are challenges, but at Chase, we, we choose to see those as, an, as that as an opportunity. And a little later on in the panel, I'll tell you about the investments we're making to expand access to those opportunities. Thank you very much. And I want to give Dr. Kleinberg a few minutes to share your thoughts. Thank you. I just wanted to add uh, just a couple of thoughts. Because um, I think there's, there's room for pessimism, but there's also room for tremendous optimism and opportunity. And a lot of what you're hearing here in this upscale Houston that the Greater Houston Partnership has, has launched, and both of you are, are working under those auspices. We'll talk some about that. But also early childhood. You had, you had uh, Carolyn, you had pre K, pre K to 12. We know that rich kids start kindergarten one and a half to two years ahead of poor kids. And those poor kids have no chance of catching up. The, the moment of truth in, in education is third grade reading. If you're reading at the third grade level, or if you're not reading at third grade level than third grade, you are four times more likely to drop out of high school. And the single most powerful predictor whether you're reading at third grade level is, did you start kindergarten ready to learn to read? And make that transition from learning to read to reading to learn. And preschool is critical. And we know how critical it is. And there's now a, a, a common sense, again, led by the Great Houston Partnership, but many others as well, to make that happen, to ensure that every single child in Harris County gets access to quality preschool from birth through the age of six. When the brain is growing by 80%, when that's where learning occurs at the greatest, at the greatest rate. And, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a city that is preparing, I think, in, in really interesting ways to address these critical questions, recognizing that this is, this is that investing in this kind of education is as critical a priest, a, 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 a infrastructure investment in the economic prosperity of this nation and this city and the knowledge economy of the 21st century as dredging the ship channel was for the economic prosperity of Houston in the 20th century. The source of wealth is knowledge, investing in knowledge is the critical infrastructure requirement if we're going to succeed. The other thing I want to just mention quickly, we are releasing on November 7th a new report that analyzes the findings from what we have now, uh, you know, over the last 21 years of Houston surveys, interviewed over 4,800 U.S.-born Latinos and 
4,300 Latino immigrants. So you can ask the question, what happens to Latino immigrants the longer they're in this country? And, and, and so we can compare them to the second generation Latinos born in this country of immigrant parents, and third generation born in this country of parents who were also born in this country. And with all the, the tremendous challenges, there is enormous strength and resources and resilience. The longer Latino immigrants are in this country, the more, even though with low levels of education, they work their way out of poverty, the more they learn English and, and do the surveys in English, the more they have close personal friends who are African-American, Latino, and, I mean, Anglo and Asian, the more they believe that if you work hard in this city, eventually you will succeed. I mean, there's a, there's a quality to this, to this Latino community that is enormously resourceful and powerful and, and suggests a community prepared to benefit from these opportunities that, that the rest of the community is going to make available. So, so uh, one ought not to be without hope, as I said. There's reasons for a lot of optimism and a lot of sense that this city can be the model for what all of America is, is challenged to do. And we can do it in a way that can be, can, can point the way to what America can be in the 21st century. So it's, uh, it's a good time to be meeting together and thinking about these kinds of issues. Thank you for that. And I, I thank you all for showcasing um, many of the needs that we have in our community, but also many of the things that are working and having an impact in our community. So just during this time, you all have mentioned workforce development certainly as an issue, early childhood education, housing. I'm wondering, and I'm going to open this up to the entire panel, could you all comment about what we can do? And when I say we, I mean policymakers, philanthropy, nonprofits, corporations. How can we foster some collaborative work between those industries and those sectors to be able to make progress? Or what would you prioritize as the best things that we should do? I'll start from a um, housing standpoint. One of the things that we're starting to look at, and it is starting to um, take place here in Houston as well, is that housing has to be a part of a collaborative. Uh, you don't look at housing in a vacuum. You look at housing um, when partnering with the school system, with jobs, and the overall process. There is um, an organization out of Atlanta called Purpose Built Communities, and they created a, um, a we could 
take advantage of to push this information into HISD. And it became apparent that one of their programs that they wanted was an elementary school. So we were literally moving down the food chain into the younger and younger ages to, to begin to plant those seeds and to, and to expose them to the opportunities that are out there that they or their parents or their grandparents may not have had uh, in, their, in their family circles or in their circles of influence. So, um, so really, it's, it's a downward motion to the younger and younger ages to let them know that these possibilities are there and here's how to get there and that they are attainable. So, exactly, exactly. Birds are career. Now I'll just add, um, and I'll speak to workforce, uh, there's a tremendous amount of collaboration already underway. Uh, and just to, ex just to further exemplify that, uh, Stephen referenced the Greater Houston Partnerships Regional Workforce Task Force. And that task force met for six months last year and it culminated in uh, this report, which you can download from GHP's website. And part of that uh, report includes an inventory and they found that there are over 70 organizations working to address workforce challenges in our region. That doesn't include the nine community colleges in our region or the approximately 70 school districts. So there's a lot of people working really diligently on this problem. Uh, but the, so the question becomes, how can we do more, better, and faster? And I would, I would say it comes down to really four, four S's um, to address the challenges on the systems level. And one, it's uh, success measures. I think our uh, generally Our workforce uh, groups haven't come together to decide what success looks like. And if we had some shared definitions of what success looks like and, and the ability to tell that story with numbers, it would help us align our efforts. Uh, the second S has to do with segmentation. And I referenced that in my opening remarks, but we really don't have a good handle on the needs and the characteristics of the people that we're targeting for these middle school jobs. What, what kinds of things do they want to pursue? What are their current skill levels? What are their aspirations? And by understanding the market that we're trying to serve, we can better right-size solutions to meet their needs. Uh, the next S is stakeholders. Uh, we need to better understand the incentives and constraints of the stakeholders working on this. How are community colleges constrained? How are businesses constrained? How are nonprofits constrained? And what are the opportunities to work together? So by understanding incentives and constraints, we can target our efforts on the things that we can really change. And finally, scale. I think if we're able to um, find cost-effective ways to scale what works, we can have the most efficient use of resources.
the available jobs, and if they do know about the jobs, they have outdated perceptions about them. We have a gap in basic skills. Too many of our potential workers lack the hard and soft skills required by employers. There's a lack of coordination between efforts, and there's a lack of uh, real-time real labor market information. And so the Greater Houston Partnership is leading the way in addressing these gaps and has formed uh, committees for awareness, data, Stephen's serving on that data committee, um, education and other committees are being formed right now. But if you would like to plug into that effort, there is a workforce summit, the first ever summit for our region coming up on November 12th at University of Houston's Conrad School. And you can learn more about that on the uh, Greater Houston Partnership website. We've invited speakers, uh, local and national, to talk about what's new and what's next. And there'll be opportunities for you to learn more about how you can engage in this effort. I'll, I'll just echo real quickly what Carolyn said. Uh, the, what's happening right now in, um, in, in Houston, in the whole te Texas and Louisiana Gulf Coast, is similar to the situation um, that Dr. Kleinberg uh, illustrated after World War II. You had a, you had a, a high um, uh, a market for uh, what, what used to be called blue collar jobs. I think that now they're middle skill jobs. Um, but uh, there was there was an enormous amount of, of, of blue collar middle skill jobs in America, um, and that that is that is in essence, in essence been been exported over the last 50 years. Um, and, and it's been reflected in our school systems where, where we, have, we have geared our high schools to graduate every high school student um, with the goal of getting to a four-year college. And that, in, in essence, did not mince word, has failed miserably. Um, if you look at the numbers that um, came out of this study that the, uh, the Houston Endowment um, funded, in Houston, 20% of our eighth graders after they've graduated high school, have any sort of degree, certificate, associate's degree, 20%, and that's six years after high school. So that, that system that we've built to, to create a, a white collar society um, left with the, uh, with, with the jobs that we've exported over the last half century. Well, what is happening now in North America with the onset of, of this oil and gas industry um, will re-energize the blue collar jobs, the welders, the pipe fitters, the process techs, the instrument techs, the truck drivers, um, all of those all of those jobs that we consider middle skills or blue collar. Um, that's why we're not prepared to fill all of those jobs right now is because that gap was there. And what will happen over the next decade and possibly two decades is that we manufacture products here domestically that are that are considered intermediate product products. And we export those. That's like I, said, I mentioned. We export more to the other side of the world polymers to be manufactured into our, our cell phones and our cameras and our clothes, and anything made out of plastic that we use every day of our lives. The equation has changed because of our low price of feedstock, because of our ability now to produce these middle products, these intermediate products here, cheaper than anywhere in the world, that very, very shortly um, you will begin seeing the reshoring um, of the of the manufacturing of the of the finished products, and then here in Texas, certainly, um, we should see another decade or two of growth in manufacturing, which creates those blue collar jobs, which lets so many of Americans um, rise up from the levels uh, of, of low paying jobs to very competitive um, middle school or blue school, blue collar type jobs, and and. I think, I think we need to be ready for that. I think we need to look at that and look at how we um, educate uh, our population so that we are continually training um, uh, the population to step into these jobs and again, rise all of those boats at the same time. So. Um, from a housing standpoint, um, I think it's two things. It is um, educating the public and money. Um, from a standpoint of educating the public, when we talk about affordable housing, people get scared because they don't really understand what that means. Uh, people generally immediately jump to, oh, that's public housing, that's people sitting around not working, that's drugs, that's crime, and they jump to that place. 
particularly when we're talking affordable housing, we're talking those persons in the 30 to 50 percent average to medium income. Those persons who a lot of times are first time teachers, city workers, persons even working full time at Target, people out there working every day, but simply need that subsidy that comes in the form of the way the developer has subsidized the development of rental property or subsidies such as first time homeowners loans for them to own a home, we're simply talking about ways to subsidize so that they are able to afford to make a, I mean, to live each day. One of, the, one of the biggest statistics that we know in the housing world is that children who live in decent and safe housing do better in school. They generally graduate from high school and go on to college. And so housing is important because it is that first step. It is where children lay their heads down each night. People go out and get a job from that place. But we have to find money, and that money being the public dollars that allows the subsidy of first-time homeowners or developers to build rental housing to be able to allow those persons who are in that 30 to 50 percent average median income, who, as Carolyn mentioned earlier, are barely making a living or are barely able to take care of all of the things that they need. Um, if you looked at the study, one of the things the study showed was that people are burdened with their housing, um, with their housing um, costs. Too many people are spending 30, 40, 50 percent of what they make to simply live in a decent place. So we need to find ways to educate the community so that they're not doing, having situations of nimbyism and afraid when you say affordable housing when it is coming into their neighborhoods. And they're not fighting against that, but we also have to find the money to continue to subsidize these um, developments of these homes so that people can move into decent areas. Just from our surveys, and it ties into, into much of what you're talking about. And what is striking and fascinating is that younger angles are so much more comfortable with all this than older angles. One of the fun questions we asked was, have you ever been involved in a romantic relationship with someone who was not Anglo? And of angles under the age of 40 or 45, about 55 percent, I keep asking yes to do that. And among older angles, it drops down to 15, 17 percent. And it's a reminder that we older angles grew up in the the world of the 1960s and 70s and 80s were a radically different place in the world of the 2000s, 1990s and 2000s, when younger people came of age. And there's that wonderful uh, law of human nature that says what I am familiar with feels right and natural, what I'm unfamiliar with feels unnatural and somehow not quite right. And so every question we ask about comfort with diversity, about, about the, uh, support for immigration, about the belief, for example, you think in the increasing ethnic diversity of Houston will eventually become a source of great strength. Or growing problems. Every single question like that is predicted by age among animals. And so there's a sense again of a younger generation coming of age with far less resistance to this idea of living with people who are not PLUs, but people like us, and, and much more than the world. Well, I, I really want to thank you all, and I think what we heard from you in this last question was that there's a tremendous amount of awareness that needs to be shared not only with those who can employ our population, but also the population in general, that we don't truly understand what the workforce, what the housing, or the education issues are. And so finding that common lexicon is going to be really important as we move forward. So I do want to thank the panelists and move into the Again, thank you to all the panelists. Appreciate you guys coming out here and talking. Now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Steve Kaffer with the Institute for Sustainable Peace. And he's going to do just a little product for all of us. So if we haven't said it before, let us say it again. Thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, Adley Stevenson had the misfortune of running twice for president against the most popular man in America, and as his consolation prize, he was made the ambassador to the 
United Nations, which put him on the lunchtime speaking circuit. And he used to say to people, if uh, it's my job today to speak and yours to listen, if you happen to finish your job before I do, please feel free to get up and leave. <laughs> and um, so uh, some of you finished your job before we finished ours today. And so I want to say a double thank you for those who have stayed. Now, what we don't have... <laughs> have any control over is how you listen. We have no control over how you listen today. Uh, for some of you, you've been uh, actively engaged in addressing some of the very problems that are featured in the equity profile. And uh, some of you, I suspect, were going, yeah, I know that, I know that, I, yeah, I knew that too. Uh, others of you were saying, I don't think that's right. I, you know, uh, no, they're missing something here. Our hope is that at some point in the city of Houston with people like yourselves who are full of passion, and most of you have been passionate enough not only to take the time to be here today, but you really have been persevering in addressing some area of inequity. Our hope is that something that was said today was an aha moment for you. Something stirred you enough to say, wait a second, I, I want to know more about that. Whether it's I want to meet that person, or I want to read that report, or I want to go to that website. For some of you, it was not only I want to know more about it. Our hope is that someplace, somebody said, oh, wait a second. With all of these great organizations represented in the room, with a city like Houston with a can-do attitude, with institutions like Rice and the Kinder Institute doing all of this research, and now an outside entity like uh, the policy link coming in and saying, in spite of our best efforts, we are a vulnerable city as we look into the future. How can that be? I'm, I'm not willing anymore to just talk. I don't want to just read the reports or go hear an erudite panel like we had today. I want to do something else. Um, including, maybe, uh, what Carolyn said there about having shared goals. I won't repeat everything, but shared goals and then people who, in addition to shared goals or shared measures of impact, say, there are 80 of us working on workforce development. What if in addition to shared goals, it's going to take shared labors and shared learning and shared resources? I'm ready to do something. So, we're asking you to take some time around the tables and simply say what got stirred or disturbed in you today. What got stirred or disturbed? We were going to have uh, 20 minutes. We were going to have you report back. We, time, we're behind on the curve. So here's what we're saying. 15 minutes. You have two questions on your table that are some version of what got stirred or disturbed in you. In 15 minutes, we'll call it to a close. Some of you are used to talking for the entire 15 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much for looking around your table and saying, I consider you more important than myself. I will limit myself to two minutes because I want to hear from you, and if there's extra time, I can talk again. Some of the members of the Graduate School of Social Work are here. They're willing to take notes. They will not record your name to protect the innocent, but we do want to capture what is it that you talk about. 15 minutes, your time begins now. If there might be some.
of the equity profile. It is really helpful when somebody else from outside Houston comes and takes a snapshot of us. Uh, you know, the essence of leadership at heart when change is needed is for somebody to tell a very clear, accurate picture of current reality and juxtapose it to just as clear a picture of a preferred future. The tendency is to either minimize the picture of the preferred future by saying we'll never get there, or to magnify the efforts of the current uh, reality and say it's not as bad as we think it is. And the truth of the matter is, there's more done when, the, when that tension is sustained and people are unwilling to stay in the present such that they make sacrifices to move to the future. So please read the report. Uh, for those of you who took the notes, would you please make sure they're turned in because the planning team wants to see what's on the hearts and minds. What got stirred by those of you who were here. You're terrific. Thank you so very much. Um, turn it back over to... I'm going to give it to me away from the feedback of the people. Thank you so much, Steve. And I'm going to be very, very brief out of respect for your time and your willingness to be here today. So you guys, you know, you guys are walking the walk, talking the talk, and you guys are the warriors around these issues, around making it Houston to have a better quality of life. So we, we you know, you come to these things all the time, that was good data, and yeah, I knew that. So, and then you're like, okay, so now what? This is the part where we talk about, so now what? This is the part where we talk about what can happen from this point forward. And I just wanna like, like I've been involved with the, I work at Metro, and I worked on a HGAC, Sustainable Communities Initiative, and that's kinda how I got engaged and mobilized about all of the money, all of the opportunity, all of the different things that are happening, and we met many of you. Um, and so, but I first personally felt always compelled that underneath all of this was this growing gap. Despite all of the fabulousness that is in Houston, this inequality gap is increasing. And, and, and people, like when it could, kind of have coalesced, coalesced over the last, say, year or so to form the, the fledgling beginnings of what you might dare call a movement called the Opportunity Network for Houston Galveston. And we are really at the beginning stages of that. And I, so we want to, we will be contacting, we'll be doing three things moving forward from today. I want to leave you with three things. We're going to be following up with all of you. If you didn't sign in, please do that so that we can have your contact information. And further, we're going to be taking the steps to get our act together, and to be smart, to leverage, and do something out of the box and different to have a collective impact. I just heard Dr. Kleinberg say that. How can we maximize a collaborative effort to have collective impact for our region? What does that look like? How do we kind of, you know, take advantage of all of the different things we heard discussed today and really impact the challenges that we're gonna face. So my co-chair, Otto Brown's gonna come here, talk a little bit more about what the Opportunity Network is starting to um, engage, engage upon. And I want to just leave you with one other thought, which is, yes, you're all gonna vote, I'm sure of that, but I wanna compel you to do like they used to do back then. The, the older days, and make sure all your relatives and about four or five other people literally ask them, Are you voting? And if you know, you're going to have a problem with me because you've got to vote because that is so critical to all that we do and all that we will be able to accomplish moving forward. So I just want to make sure to leave you with that and let you know that you will be hearing from us. And we appreciate you so much for all that you do. And we look forward to having collective impact with you, and I'm going to let you come to talk about the network a little bit more. Thank you, Monique. Thank you, everybody, for um, staying and being a part of this event. You know, as we've been working on the Opportunity Network, we're trying very hard to be very deliberate about what we're doing. Um, many of you, like many of us, have sat in these kinds of rooms, these kinds of conferences. We've heard these, these stories, and although there's a lot of movement in the room, 
we ought to get stuck with what's next and what really can impact what we're trying to do. And one of the things that's been very clear to us is making the distinction between equality and equity. Um, many people don't understand or, or make those two synonyms when they're actually very different. So if I handed out an afternoon snack to everybody and one third of the room got yogurt, one third got an apple, and one third got a salad and gave everybody a fork, then I would have demonstrated equality. Everybody has the same tool. But in fact, one group doesn't need any tools to be able to eat their snack. The other is already done with their salad. And the third may try to eat the yogurt with the fork, but it might end up being somewhat sloppy for them in the process. And so what we're trying to do at the Opportunity Network is to create a toolbox that has in it many different resources, many pathways to success, and look at these systemic intersections where we can create sound and sustainable solutions to ensure progress for all of those who really want to take advantage of it. And so Houston, really sits at an opportunity to maximize the diversity of thought with the diversity of people, which can be a very powerful thing. So we encourage you to get involved with the Opportunity Network. Again, we thank you for being here, and we're very hopeful that this is going to be the beginning of something that is very impactful in our region to sustain us economically and in all the definitions of prosperity in the future. So thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like to thank all the host organizations that uh, helped with this project, LISC, uh, Houston Tomorrow, the Opportunity Network, and the Institute for Sustainable Peace, and we appreciate all your help in doing this. Uh, that's our program. I'll thank the panel once more for you guys. Y'all did great. And uh, thank you everybody for coming out. Appreciate it. And remember, uh, our vote starts uh, Monday, so get out and vote.